Hold on right now. We've got 10 seconds till the second wave takes off. This is the next group of runners that's about to take off for the 42nd running of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. Let's watch them take off. They've got those butterflies going as well. They've been ready to make it roll and get it going. A lot of people running for charity. A lot of people running for, for personal best, just achievements on their own. A lot of people make marathons something of a bucket list. And then they kind of get addicted, I think. Well, and a lot of people probably wonder, why do they do waves in marathons? Why do they send off 5,000 or whatever the size of the wave is and then wait a few minutes before the next wave goes? Well, first of all, it means that all these athletes get that experience of the start and yeah. the booming oh, that booming music sense. and that sense, that atmosphere. But secondly, it spreads the pressure on the resources along the course, the water stations, the feed stations, and so on. Uh, and, and of course, the lead runners of this second group will gradually join up with the, the tail enders of the first Group. Sure. So it just spreads the runners yeah. along the course in a nice even way and they're not too bunched. And it's a lot for the spectators as well to see. It's good to see keep it coming, keeping folks coming so people can get excited about them. Absolutely. All right, we have something special this year, guys. We want you to take a look at your screen. Yeah, you should be watching anyway to see if you can see any familiar <laughs> faces in there. But we also have a QR code. This is a really cool code that you can put your camera phone on, the phone on your camera, point it toward the QR code. This will take you to the NBC Chicago app. Now, the NBC Chicago app will have this race continuously even after we go off the air at 11 o'clock so you can watch a friend or a loved one that might be coming through. You can watch it all day long. We'll have a lot of great marathon content there. We've also got all your news and weather. If you want to check the weather and see how the wind is doing that may affect one of your loved ones or a friend that you may have out there running, so all you have to do again is point the camera on your phone to the QR code. That will direct you right to the NBC Chicago app. We've done it here before. It's a really cool feature and a very easy way to get right to the NBC Chicago app. Tons of information and content. Tons of information. It's good stuff. So excited. Look at that. There's still thousands and thousands to go. We do set, have a third it? wave to come as well. I love this right here. I do. I love it too. Just the, the humanity of it. This all. is when you start seeing, you know, all walks of life. Yes. You've got, you know, your moms and your dads and your grandmas and your little ones, and it's it's a beautiful thing. It really is. All ethnicities, colors. All ethnicities from all over the world. Again, we have all 50 wards represented. We have 29 neighborhoods that they get to visit. 135 countries. And 135 countries. 50 states. It's amazing. Absolutely cool. And 1.7 million spectators cheering them along the way. Marion knows them all. Each one of them, personally. <laughs> all right, so our elite runners, you guys, let's talk a little bit more about the water stations as we went through. You, what exactly? Because all of their these elite runners that are running, they're picking up their specific fluids. There's something particularly that they're going through. And they're very deliberate with it. Well, well I, the elite athletes handed in eight bottles yesterday, last night. They're refrigerated overnight, and those eight bottles are spread out along the course at the, at the stations every 5K, about every three miles. They get a personal drink. Yeah, and, and what we saw at that water station is we saw Galen Rupp get stretched out, and I'd like to hear from Todd to see what's going on there because it looks like, Todd, it looks like Galen has dropped from that lead pack. Todd, can you hear me? Yeah, you know, about a mile ago, he was looking back like he, to see if there were anybody else he could run with, and then it just like the band broke, and now he's he's in ninth place, falling off the back of this lead pack. It's we've got a pack of eight now with Mo in there, but uh, Gerono's in second of the pack. He's taking the lead, but most of the time so far through uh, seven miles, which is 204 pace, Chumba's really done a good job. You know, I was, I was looking at Chumba's stats, thinking about this is his 20th marathon. He's averaged 207 over those first 19. Um, He's, he's really looking good right now. Karoki's in there, and Toronto is now up with the two pacers and, and looking really comfortable. But yeah, Rupp is off the back, Todd, and he's going to have a long uh, last 20 miles. Todd, do you think it was just a conscious effort on Rupp's part, knowing that he's probably not in 204 shape right now, so he's just backing off? I, I would hate to think that he's hurting at this point in time. Uh, you know, he still looks okay. I think he's probably, and you know, we touched on this at the beginning. I think he just wants a really solid effort. You know, he went out with it, you know, right. averaging 443, 444, but now he's probably feeling a little bit. And he probably wants to finish this thing with a good effort going into the, going into the Olympic trials. But he is going to be solo the rest of the way. 
The thing is that, you know, 204 is way quicker than Galen Rupp has ever run before. We've got to remember that the guy's PR is 206, you know, so he is not only coming back from a year without racing, with a few question marks in his own mind, surely, but he's gone out at something that he's in territory he's never been before. So, yeah, it's, 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 he's had to commit, but now he's, in, uh, he's isolated, and you're dead right, Todd. It could be a really tough next, next period. Yeah, I, I think it's a smart move on his part, realizing he's not in 204 shape. I mean, even at his best, 206 is his, is his PR. And so right now he's just ratcheting it back and going, okay, this is going to be the loneliness of the long-distance runner here yeah. for the next 20 miles. I'm going to try to hone in on this and try to try to run a very good, uh, maybe kind of time trial effort on his own and looking at people who are gradually going to be dropping back, he's going to be catching those people. And psychologically, look, he's coming back from a year off because of an injury. And he probably doesn't want to have any mistakes happen either where he ends up either re-injuring himself Absolutely or... Not. Or, you know, yeah. really affecting his ability to do well at the trials. And right. he, he, he even alluded on Friday to the fact that his training was a little unorthodox because of the health issues that and he's experienced. And that makes sense. Yeah, masses of swimming, tons of hours in the pool, uh, where you're obviously... Uh, uh, you're sort of simulating the running action, but there's no weight-bearing yeah. uh, stress. Right. The, the best thing for Galen to do today is just to have a nice, solid effort kind of leading the way for the uh, U.S. Olympic trials coming up in the end of February. If he can run in the 210 range, I think he would be happy with today's efforts. I think you're right. All right, let's stay with us now. We're going to check back in with the uh, runners when we come back from the 42nd running of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. Don't go anywhere. My name is Tim Hedzima, and I am the executive director of the Abbott World Marathon Majors. We are a family of the six largest and most renowned marathons on the planet, including Tokyo, Boston, London, Berlin, New York City, and of course here with the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. It's an opportunity for the six great events to collaborate on different levels, but also to, to recognize some of the great wheelchair athletes and Paralympic athletes that we have, some of the greatest runners in the world that will compete across these six great events. I think it's elevated the sport of marathon running. I think the sharing of best practices has allowed us to improve race date runner experience for our participants. It's allowed us to talk about and elevate the awareness of the charity programs in our events. So it's, it's been an exciting journey for us and there's still more to come. This year, Series 13 will begin in Chicago. The series offers a way to recognize the achievements of both professional and amateur athletes. Our professional athletes compete for the top spot on the leaderboard and a share of our $820,000 prize purse. Series 13 kicking off in Chicago is, is a big deal for us. It's the, it's the home of uh, Abbott, our title sponsor, and to move the, the kickoff of the Season 13 with the wheelchair athletes and everything that's going on with what's going to happen on race day and the field that we have, it's going to really, I think, launch Series 13 in a, in a really unique way. On the amateur side, we have several hundred runners this year aiming for the highly coveted six-star finisher medal here in Chicago. This is awarded to runners that have finished all six of our events in their lifetime. The second year of the Abbott World Marathon Majors Wanda Age Group World Rankings also begin here in Chicago, a series of 175 marathons across six continents that are qualifying events for a 2021 Age Group World Championship. Whether you're running for your first star or your sixth star here at the Bank of America Chicago Marathon, we can't wait to celebrate with you in October. Welcome back to our coverage of the 2019 Bank of America Chicago Marathon. I'm Kai Martin on course in Boys Town, Mile 8, the best aid yes. station. I am joined by some of the 12,000 volunteers on course for the runners. We have Miss Janet Jackson and Cher with us. I'm so glad you could make the trip to Chicago. First of all, what is it like out here and the attitude?
two as we get ready for the elites to come down. I just, I love my fans. I'm, I'm so thankful for all of them. They just bring such good energy, and I love you all. Love you all. What is it like to provide that extra spark to the runners as they come through? Does yeah. it, does it give you an extra this spark? Is, that's why we do this. I mean, they're coming around, and we just want them to feel like they're having a good time and getting an extra spark, like you said, and giving whatever we can do to help get them through this, because that's pretty awesome they're running something like this. So that's why we're here. They're still fresh at this point. You know, it's mile yeah. eight. They're taking their Gatorade. Do people dance with you as they run? Yeah, there are a lot of dancing and a lot of selfies. We have to stop mid-routine sometimes and do a selfie, and it's so much fun, because they get that memory for the rest of their life. Thank you, Cher. Thank you, Janet. Uh, how many years have you been volunteering here? Uh, four for me. Three for me. You find people come back again and again, yes, part of this yeah, community. Yeah. yeah, we love it. We love seeing familiar faces, and it's just such a great group of people out here. Really, really grateful for them. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Thank you, Cher. Gosh, we have so many celebrities out here. We have Britney Spears. The elites should be coming through any minute. Here they are. Take a look. Marion and Siapa. There's the motorcade. They should be coming through any moment. And there's some news happening, actually, as we speak. Tim, can, are we? Absolutely. Mo Farah dropped back maybe 30, 40 meters from this uh, lead group. The pacemakers are unrelentingly sticking to a tempo of around 204, two, uh, two hours, four minutes, 20 seconds. They're heading, you know, we knew they were trying to go for 62 minutes at halfway. But Ed, I'm a little shocked that Mo Farah is back off this uh, group of six or seven guys. Yeah. I don't know if he's going through a bad patch or what, but, and, and is that Ab Abdi Bashir, his training partner with him with the yellow arm sleeves. Uh, that is Mo Farah in the all red back there. This is, uh, this is un unexpected. Well, it is, especially when you have six other athletes that have decided to continue with those pace setters. And again, I think this might be a conscious decision on Mo's part. Just going, you know, 204 right now. Maybe it's too cold. Maybe it's too windy. I don't think I can maintain this. I think the fact that uh, uh, Bashir Abdi is with him and is his training partner would indicate that they have decided to do this together. But they're at least three, four, five seconds off of that lead pack right now. And so uh, he, he's kind of reaching reaching uh, towards his side right now. Uh, not a good sign for Mo Farah, particularly if there was just one runner up there ahead and they had dropped back, then maybe I would think that's fine. But the fact that there's five, six guys in there, it's going to be difficult. Uh, but, but we'll see. We'll see how the next few miles unfold. We'll see. Maybe they're running uh, kind of like Bridget Koskai is, maybe a little bit too ambitious. And so he is just running his own pace. Well, I, I would understand Mo being back there if they were going out at 61 minute right. flat tempo. But they're not. They're at 62, outside 62 minute flat half marathon tempo. Mo's been and gone in the last two Londons. He's gone much quicker than this. So, yeah, it's really cold. And the gap is widening, actually, as, as you guys are having this is. conversation. It's widening pretty quickly. And of course, of course, entering this race, there are five men in this field who've run faster personal bests than Moe's. Mo going through nine miles there and about 42.50, uh, which is, we'll extrapolate from that. But, you know, he's, he's running quick, but that gap is growing every minute. There's another few meters being put on that gap. And I, I, I'm not quite sure what is going through the mind of Mo Farah. Well, it could be a lot of the pressure that he's got undergone in the last two weeks with the Alberto Salazar saga. We shall see. Yeah, he has been asked a lot of questions, even though it's been two years since he was coached by Salazar at every press conference. And you know how aggressive the British press can be, Tim. Specifically, they have been hounding him repeatedly. They even sent folks down to Flagstaff where he trained to try to find him to ask him more questions about his training. So he is feeling that pressure. I don't think there's any doubt about that. There's also the fact that since 1977, only five men have won this race in back-to-back -back years. So it's, it's a hard feat to accomplish. Yeah, but Mo's used to that pressure. You know, he's, he's a very, very experienced guy. They've been locked away in that isolation uh, effectively in Flagstaff. So they've been away from the pressures. You know, I mean, Mo's apparently Gary was saying to me last night, his coach, that he spends nearly all day on his phone when he's not running. So he, <laughs> he is reading stuff. You know, yes. He's aware of what's going on he's out there. He's very aware. He's pretty good at absorbing those pressures and doing what needs to be done. I'm, I'm hoping that this is uh, either a, 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 a willful tactic or he's just going through a bad patch. But, you know, when he won his Olympic titles and his world titles on the track, he would often be at the back of the pack. There'd be 20 guys strung out in front of him, and he'd be right at the back, and he'd bide his time and just gradually move up mid-race, and, and then they'd be there when he came to the business end of the race. 
This is a long, long way from the business end of the race, so it is concerning. Uh, all right, let's check in now with Bridget Kozga. Carrie Tollison is in front of our female leader. How's she looking there, Carrie? Well, Bridget looks good. She's really focusing on her pacemakers right now. She can finally see the truck in front of her with her paces. And so they have settled down. Her last mile was 510. That's her slowest mile. So you guys, she's still on well under rec world record pace. And you know, one thing that we do so, have to talk about, she's coming into this race running so much faster this year than she did last year. Her tune-up last year was 67 minutes. This year, it was 64 minutes. You know, she knows Ed, how to win in big margins. Strong. And so she has her sights on this time and this win. She looks super smooth. She's sort of telling the Pacers at times to move over. She was clipping their feet at times. So I've been hearing you guys, and I know she's out fast, but she does look really good right now. She's got a long way to go, but you can tell she's on a mission. Yeah, well, Carrie, that last mile you said was 5.10. Now, 5.10 is the pace she needs to run to run 2.15.25 if she ran that from the start. But she went out so much faster than that. You, you say she looks comfortable, though, at this 5.10 pace. Do you think the Rabbits now have in mind that this is a good pace for her and they can continue on? And can she settle and hold this 5.10 pace for the rest of the race? Yeah, you know, I hope she didn't go out too fast in that first four miles, but she has now settled into this 510. The Pacers are paying more attention to their own clocks. They're kind of communicating a little bit more, and I do think they are on this pace, and they're going to stay here. She knows where the wind is at times. She's moving closer to them when she needs to. She's backing off when she can. So I just feel like now the race has begun. I just hope she didn't go out too hard too early, and and spend too much energy in that first 5K. All right, thank you so much, Carrie. We'll check in with you again a little bit later. We're going to take a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more from the 42nd running of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. the Bank of Chicago Marathon. We are at mile marker 10. I'm in the lead truck right in front of the elite runners. And please, don't think me shallow, but I love those pink shoes these guys are wearing. It is amazing. They are running with very little on, but the spectators are as layered up as all of us. And yet there is such enthusiasm on these streets or just south of Francis Parker School. Now reaching Francis Parker School, there's music, there's water, there are volunteers, there's generosity because this city turns out people who, and it always amazed me when I was running, why in the world would people come out to watch crazy runners going 26.2 miles, but they do with bells and whistles and bullhorns. It's a remarkable sight. The runners, and now we've just lost sight of them for a second, but, sorry, we're turning the corner at Webster and Sedgwick at the moment. We are almost, almost halfway through this marathon. Boys Town was phenomenal, I must tell you. I love Boys Town every time we come through it. Elvis impersonators, there was Cher. It was fabulous, Janice Jackson. So there's a sense out here, there's a feeling out here of all the possibilities that you can achieve when you do a marathon, when you run this race. From the lead truck in front of the elite runners, I'm Carol Marine. Back to our coverage. And welcome back to the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. You're looking at the elite men. A, a, a big gap has grown here between a, a yeah, you group can see of Farah and, uh, and Mo Farah, last year's defending champion in the red, and then behind him, Galen Rupp. Galen Rupp. I don't even see Galen Rupp at this point. 
All right. Series 12 of the Ab and World Marathon Majors came to a close in Berlin this year, crowning champions in the men's and women's elite field along with the men's and women's wheelchair racers. As you can see, three of the champions are competing here in Chicago today. And the Bank of America Chicago Marathon is the crown jewel of the Abbott World Marathon Major Series 13. Today is the first race in the series, although the men's marathon results at the IAAF World Championships last month do count toward the series. The other races in the competition include the New York City Marathon, the Tokyo Marathon, the Boston Marathon, the London Marathon, the Olympic Marathon, which will be in Tokyo, the Berlin Marathon, and Series 13 concludes at next year's Chicago Marathon when four champions will once again be crowned. All right, and we're going to check back in with some of the athletes. Specifically right now, we want to look at the women's wheelchair. There's Tatiana McFadden. We don't know where she is in the pack right now, but she looks pretty strong. She has dealt with a lot of... Oh, there's the leaderboard right there. That, Curse yeah, that, first, McFadden second, Scaroni Shar and Di Rosario. Yeah, that, that picture is Manuela Shar, 251 right now, and I don't know if she She's taken the lead at this point, but that she is pushing, pushing very hard. Last time we, last we heard was that she has broken away from another pack of Susanna uh, Scaroni, uh, Tatiana McFadden, Amanda McRory. I think Manuela Shar realizes with, with the kicking ability of Tatiana McFadden, it's good for her to get a bit of a lead uh, so she doesn't have to have a sprint finish with M McFadden, who is oh, one of the all-time greats. My bad. No, no, this is Shar. It is Shar. Yeah, well, Shar. What we have to remember is that Manuela Shah holds the world record, you know, yeah. on, a, on a fast, valid course. She has the world record. This is a fast, valid course. So it absolutely suits her strong points. You know, uh, Tatiana McFadden, really, really powerful. She's probably good on hills, maybe better than Shah on the hills. But this, there are no hills on this course. So uh, Shah here playing to her strengths. And if somebody adopts this tactic, you know, wheelchair racing or in, 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 in able-bodied racing, these guys go flat out. If somebody goes flat out, there is no tactic you can do to contend with that. Yeah. Right. What are you going to do? Rugby yeah. tackle them? I mean, <laughs> you can't pull them to the wrestle them to the ground. They're gone. You wonder, and and she does look like she's by herself right now. Yeah. All right, let's check in with the men's elite field. Who's up? At, you got Karakai there. I can't see all the names, but the. What's the pace? What pace? Chumba, Chumba's up front. He was our Chicago Marathon champ back in 2015 and has run 204.32 uh, when he finished third. So he's looking very strong. Pack of six guys, six guys that you would think would be in there. Again, we have six uh, that have run under 206, and we've got a couple in that pack who haven't run quite that fast, but they're taking advantage of an, just an ideal day. I don't think the wind is as heavy as we had initially thought it might be, so just great. Great conditions. And there in the back, just making that turn, we see Sir Mo. Uh, and Galen. look at that. Galen, Galen Rupp has hooked up with them. That's yeah. great. But these six fellas, you know, they will be aware that Mo Farah has dropped back off them. I'm sure they will have had the old glance back at they've done corners where you get an opportunity to look to check across. Uh, and they will want, not want to let up here. This is a, a major uh, point in the race where Mo Farah to have dropped back by, what, 100 meters maybe? Uh, but well before halfway, I mean, 53 minutes on the clock, they're not going to be at a halfway for another eight or nine minutes. They will um, they will redouble their efforts here to make sure this stays at a, at a decent size, this gap, if it doesn't grow. And now they're heading south. From what I understand earlier, the wind was going to be more of a factor when they started heading south. So we'll see if it does have right. any effect. You guys don't seem to think the wind will be a huge deal for these runners. Well, I think it would be if it was up a little higher, but to me, it doesn't seem like it's blowing as as uh, heavy as we thought it was going to be. And certainly, as they're running behind the pace setters and that, that wind is, is buffered somewhat, uh, and the fact that there are six other guys that are in that pack, they can kind of um, hide behind one another as they go into the wind. But you're right, they are running south right now. The wind is coming from the southwest, so this would be a time when they're going to start feeling those gusts. Yeah, you don't see too much going with some of those flags that we saw just a few minutes ago, so it didn't look too, too bad for them. But these uh, these fellas will be communicating, I'm sure. You know, Chumba, 
can tell these pacemakers, keep it going, boys, and let's push it along a little bit. There will be that sort of communication and encouragement from these athletes behind, immediately behind the two pacemakers. Their pace, pace one and two, that's Elliot Koech's pace one, pace two is Emmanuel Siner. They were due to go out at 62 minute tempo, and to be fair to them, they're doing a great job. They're within a few seconds of yeah. that, and each time a split comes through. Uh, and this men's field, they've gone through 15K in 44.10. That's 204.20 pace. So within a very few seconds, they're doing a great job, those two pacemakers. And it's it's kind of Mo Farah who hasn't stuck to the plan. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think the men's pacemakers are doing a better job than the women's pacemakers in terms of the women's pacemakers, I think, got caught up in the emotions a little bit early on, went out a little too hot and heavy uh, for Bridget Koskai. Now things have settled down. They've had a three or four miles to get in control, and now she's running her 5-10 miles, which is good for her. Uh, I just hope those initial three or four ambitious miles haven't sacrificed what would be otherwise perhaps been a world record uh, attempt. Now who, di who dictates what the pacemakers are doing? The lead, uh, lead of the pack, or how do, they, how do they communicate? Well, the pacemakers actually... <laughs> should stick to the agreed plan. You know, they, they shouldn't be running under the orders of the two or three guys behind them, certainly at this point before halfway. Uh -huh. I think it's the latter stages of the race and the pacemakers are still there at, 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 at 20 miles, at, at 28, 30 K, then there may be a little bit of leeway, but actually it's kind of the dumb thing is to stick to the plan so that Mo Farah needs to know that they're going to run 62 pace, those pacemakers, and he has a chance of closing up on them. They shouldn't really be responding to the athletes around them, and I know I mentioned it just now. They shouldn't be accelerating to 61.30 oh. oh. tempo to drag that pack further away from Mo, because that is not, as we would say in English, that's not cricket. That's not mm. what was planned. Okay, gotcha. All right, let's check in now with Kerry Tollison. She is in the moto following our leader on the women's side of the race, Bridget Kozgai. How's she looking now? Carrie. She looks the same, you guys. She's just, you know, flipping away. But she did run a 5.15 last mile. The Pacers brought it down a little bit. So we had a 5.10, 5.10, then a 5.15. So it's going to be interesting to see what we come up on 11 here and see where she's at. You know, she looks good. She looks like she's taken in her fluids. Not a lot of fluid. I know it's a cooler day. She takes just a sip and then she puts it back. Or, or throws it to the side. But you know, right now, she just really is kind of going through the motions. And this is where she kind of started to get a little antsy last year. You know, we went through about 15K with a big pack of five. And then we got right to, right before the half marathon, and then she started to really crank it down. Today's race is totally different. She's not gonna be able to crank it down like she did. She's got to maintain right now in order to keep that world record pace within reach. She's definitely still on it, but she has to keep in mind this is a big race for her to win still. So we can't see anyone behind her, but she looks great right now. Right. The strategy, I mean, clearly, she is the leader in the in the race right now. Not just this race, but just in the running as a marathoner. Right now, she's like the top woman out there. The strategy, because we've seen her over the years, but lately, the last few races, she's been dominant. Well, she has, but you know, that she was 50-58 at 10 miles. Paula Radcliffe and her world record was 51-48. Okay. So, so she is 50 seconds quicker than Paula, nearly a minute quicker at 10 miles. Carrie made an excellent point, though, in that uh, most of her major marathons in the past, she has negative splitted, meaning she's come back a lot harder the second half than the first half. Now, she's not going to be doing that today because she's gone out way hard in this first and, half, and, and it's going to be tough. And that was her concern initially. That was my concern right. initially, and I'm wondering if the fatigue level uh, will allow her to even uh, run close to what she ran over the first but, half. Or is this part of her plan? I don't think it's part of the plan. I think the, I okay. think the pace setters maybe got a little too ambitious early on, and because she has been such a great fast finisher, I would have thought that she would have wanted to e at least run an right. even pace. She's not wanted to run a positive pace, which is where you go out too hard, because then you just hurt that much more because you're in that pain zone for an extended period of time. You want to be in the pain zone for as little as possible right there towards the end. And uh, I, we'll see. I, she's a tremendous athlete. I, I hope so that she can pull it off. If she does, it'll be uh, monumental, though, having gone out that hard that first 5K. It will. All right. Don't go away. Lot to watch as we are watching the 42nd running of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. Stay with us.
coming from Wacker and Franklin. This is the halfway point. We're talking 13.1 miles. A lot of the uh, wheelchair participants have made their way through. Now we're at this point waiting for some of the elite runners to make their way through. This is an exciting race this morning, though. Um, we have stuff. Because these folks, they need a big boost. They need the spectators who are here to cheer them on. We're talking about people with cowbells, drums, signs, but most of all, you know what they have? They have a lot of love for these runners out here. They cheer on the masses. Some people here are here for family, for friends, but there's also complete strangers out here. And when you hear the roar of those spectators, it has to give you an extra boost, a boost you really need to, to make, especially if you're hitting a wall. You know, Kerry Bukowski, he's the race director. He said one of the most frequently asked questions he gets is, when are you going to put on a half marathon? Guess what? Ask no more. A new chapter running starts next year. Mark this date, folks. June 7, 2020. That is when the Bank of America half marathon hits Chicago, growing this sport and welcoming a new uh, contingent of runners to this city. And, of course, we want to thank all the volunteers. That's the latest from here. Back to you. Welcome back to the 42nd running of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. You got a split screen there. These are your leaders. Bridget Kozgai on the right, all by herself, doing well, although Ed has said she came out a little fast. We'll see how that all turns out. And then the men, this pack has thinned just a bit, but we've seen, the, seen these same six gentlemen up in front for a while. Well, we have, and, and the news on Mo Farah, for those who are concerned, I'm sure there's plenty of you out there, is that he is 31 seconds back. I mean, that is 150 meters. He is a long, long way back. You can see Chumba there is right on the heels of the pacemaker. You can see Bidan Karoki, who's more of a half marathon specialist, but is becoming a great marathon. Toronto, Toronto. Tura, trying to identify all six of these fellas, but they are, you know, they're trundling along at a good steady tempo. 20K, 59.01, Ed. They're still on 204.30 pace. 204.30 pace, they've got a good rhythm, and, and these men, although um, I think only Chumba has run uh, faster than that, 204.32, uh, I think they're feeling good about themselves right now. I think they came through a half right about 102, and so uh, continue to roll along. I like the fact that there are six of them there working together. We're down to only one pace setter, though. We would have liked to have seen two pace setters up there. That's Edwin Kowicz, who uh, is one of the actually has a, is a very accomplished 10K runner and has uh, run uh, very fast times, one hour uh, for half marathon and 2.07 for uh, the marathon. All right, we want to check in with Regina Waldrop. She's at the halfway point. Regina, I understand the elite men just passed you. How would the crowd take that in? Of course, they went crazy, Mary. The excitement, the energy, it is here at the 13.1 mile. The elite runners, they mean business. They had their game faces on as they passed us. They're pacing themselves. This is going to be an exciting race. Of course, as you mentioned earlier, we have a strong contingent of past champions, Olympians, Paralympians. They are all here competing this morning. This is so exciting for me to watch. And of course, everyone out here competing with confidence. But let's talk about what it takes to get here. We're talking about months of training, sacrifice, preparation, all being put to the test today. But of course, you know what gives them that little edge? Having the spectators out here. They are here cheering on the masses. We're talking family, friends. They're talking people with horns, cowbells, drums, signs. They have a lot of love for these runners. And of course, we want to be out here with them and we cheer them on as well. Back to you guys in the studio. 
You're absolutely right. Chicago really does come out for the runners, every one of them. People, even if they don't know someone in the race, take the time to come out and cheer them along. We really do have a fantastic city here and one that supports this wonderful race. And we're going to head back to the start, get a look at this start line. This is our third wave of runners. How excited must they be right now? They have been waiting the longest to get their <laughs> opportunity to get across this start line. Tim, you made a really good point. This is a chance for them to feel that start. So why shouldn't they get that opportunity? This is a big day for a lot of folks. They're taking off in five, four, three, two. Nope. I'm wrong on my count, but here they go. And now I, I don't know about feel the atmosphere. I'm concerned about whether they can feel their toes. <laughs> it is cool. I mean, they've been out there for three plus hours waiting for this. They really have. But you know, the adrenaline and the yeah. excitement yeah. and the crowd. Maybe they got some crowd warmth as they were waiting out there. And I just love to see all the different folks, all the different walks of life, all the different members of the community of Chicago, every single all the ward represented. Stories. And, and the people who so are interconnected many. and connected with those people running, it's amazing. You're right, there's so many amazing yeah. stories. People running for other people, people running for personal reasons, for just sure. for themselves. People running because they have charitable money aspects. Money. Oh yeah, well, there's a lot of money made. 2.8 million dollars raised for charity last year. No, 20, 22.7. Oops, my bad. 22.7. Seven. Off. A little, a little bit more. <laughs> Just a little bit more. We don't want to short change at no, all. No, we, no. Maybe it'll be 2.8 this year. All right, take a look at your screen, folks. That's the QR code. This is a really cool feature we have this year. Just point the camera on your phone to this QR code, and it'll take you directly to the NBC Chicago app. So if you have a friend or a loved one that's out there running, even after we've gone on the off the air at 11 o'clock, on the NBC Chicago app at NBCChicago.com. We will have the finish line streaming. So all you have to do is get the QR code and you can watch until the race is over, all the folks coming through. There's also great marathon content. You can keep track of what's going on with the weather. We'll also have the latest news and sports, whatever you may need. It's a super cool feature and all you have to do is point your phone, the camera on your phone right there at the QR code. It'll take you directly to the app. I love that feature. It really works quickly. It's a very efficient way to handle it. By the way, 12,500 runners are running this for the very first time. First time runners, 12,000 people got very the brave. bug, got the energy. They saw us last year, they heard Tim and Ed. And I love it. Do it. All right, let's go back to the race now. Bridget Koskai, again, all by herself. And Ed's concern here, did she go out too fast to start this race? That's what we're, we're watching to see. Well, she came through 20K in 103.27, which is about two hour and 14 minute pace, which again is ahead of world record pace. That world record pace, again, Paula Radcliffe, two hours, 15 minutes, 25 seconds, set way back in 2003 in London. That's 510 per mile, but her pace has slowed uh, substantially from those open three or four miles. Now, hopefully she's just settled in now. She can ride this pace and then hopefully finish fast as she has done in the past. And it looks like she's got a nice steady rhythm going and I like the fact that she has two pace setters right in front of her to block the wind. Well the men were 62-14 at halfway right on schedule. She should be posting halfway about now uh, and, but she's got those gaps you know Ye um, Yeshene and Berker and Siner and Waitman all running very very quickly. I mean Yeshene was on 215 tempo uh, not very long ago so this the, the way they've been dragged out uh, has been astonishing and, and they're all running at PR tempo. So, uh, I don't know, I, I still think she's overcooked it. I think she will pay for those early miles. The trend in her recent races, as you've said it, is that she will run negative splits and accelerate through the second half. But how do you accelerate off world record tempo? We shall see, we'll keep an eye on her. Right now we want to send it back to Carol Marine and check in on how it's looking as she makes her way through the course as well. Carol. So Marion, we're right now doing what we like to call the Chicago Marathon Food Run. We just passed Greek Town for the first time where flaming saganaki was invented. Can you say opa? And about three miles will be in University Village and Taylor Street, home of fabulous Italian food. If, if we could, we'd stop for a lemonade and an Italian beef. The NBC5 coverage of the 2019 Bank of America Chicago Marathon. We'll be right back.
it's really special that we get to have our trials, not only like obviously in America as a major marathon, but then in Chicago because as you'll as you've noticed, we have a huge support from the University of Illinois. The Chicago Marathon course is very comparable in terms of the topography and the conditions the athletes will face. So it yields a pretty fair result in terms of the selection process. So the athletes that perform well in that type of course are going to be the same ones that perform very well at the Paralympic Games. Chicago's like, if you could call it like a hometown marathon uh, for U of I, I think that's what it is. Okay, we got a minute left. So you guys can start cruising around easy, get yourself situated. This is number three. The best training is right here. So if your goals are still to get a Paralympic medal or win a major, then you, you should be, this is where you should be. I, I wouldn't be where I am in racing without, uh, you know, having been out here. I've learned just so much from all of my teammates. Marathons in general, they're just, the fields are so competitive that it can be anyone's race on any given day. I think it's going to be one of the best women's field in history coming out. Um, it's a year before the games, the athletes are getting into top peak shape. My major goal right now um, is trying to make a 2020 team. Um, I'll be attempting to on the track as well as the road, but um, right now my major focus is on Chicago Marathon because I love the marathon and um, so to be able to make the team for that would be really cool. The day-to-day -day training between Tatiana and Susanna really is, is it's fostering improvement from both both athletes. You know, I'm proud of being a Paralympian. I'm proud to be a wheelchair racer. I got into sports for health reasons and it led me to where I am today. I never thought about being an Olympic champion. I just worked my way up to it and it's been such a blessing. second running of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. Look at that mass of folks. We love to see everybody come out. 45,000 runners have come to a start line here in Chicago to be a part of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. Hey, we have some big news though, actually. Jordan Hesse, really the top American that we've seen running and done very well over the last seasons. We're not hearing much from her, Ed. You know what, we didn't get any splits from her after 5K, and uh, apparently it appears that she may have dropped out. And I don't know whether it just, uh, if she was injured, if she had something come up on the course, or maybe just the stress of the last couple of weeks, all of those things may have come into play. But as of right now, we have no other splits from her after the 5K mark, which is really uh, kind of upsetting because we were looking forward to, to a great performance from her. Yeah, we, we came into today just discussing the fact that she could potentially break the American record. Yes. We well, that's right. You know, and all, all the signs have been that she's, she's, she's training really well. And, and you know, uh, it's a long time to have thoughts going on in your head. And, and she has got a lot of thoughts in her head. All right, let's check in now with Kaylee Dion. Kaylee is at the charity block party near mile 15. Hey, Kaylee. Hey, Marion. We, you could feel the electricity out here just before mile 15 here at the charity block party. There are more than 60 charities that are set up to cheer some of these runners on as they move through almost halfway through the race. And we just saw some of the elites come through. We have more runners that are coming through right now. And with all of the charities that are here, you can hear them screaming. You can hear their bells. They're really helping those runners just get through that half halfway point to be able to say, okay, I can do this at this point. And here they come. Look, we've got more elite runners that are passing through at this point. Everyone cheering them on. And we have one of the charities with us right now, Chicago Run, which is a, a huge, huge program that's put together to put the youth of the city uh, in more athletic ability with running and you're really pro that and I have Danya Rosen here with me kind of explain Chicago run and what it means for the city of Chicago yeah and Kaylee we're so excited to be here today we can feel the palpable energy and excitement and that's what Chicago run does since late 2008 we've been providing a continuum of inclusive running and fitness programs to over 18,000 children and youth across Chicago so that they can enjoy the benefits of running not just physical but the mental and emotional benefits. Yeah, and you guys are out here cheering on several athletes. How many athletes do you guys have running in this year's marathon? Yeah, we have a team of 35 incredible athletes today. And 
And they know that partnering with an organization like Chicago Run means that they're adding extra meaning to their to their miles. And look around. We know how transformative running is. It changes lives. And our team believes that all kids across Chicago deserve equal opportunities to run and to enjoy the benefits. Well, thank you guys so much for being out here and for all that you do for the city of Chicago and helping with the youth. And we have so much more going on out here at the 42nd Annual Bank of America Chicago Marathon here at the Charity Block Party. I've got puppies coming up, so you're not going to want to miss that. And of course, more runners <laughs> that they make their way through mile 15. Back to you guys. All right, thanks so much, Kaylee. We're also looking at Daniel Romanchuk, who is in the lead, poised and on his way to becoming a two-peat you know, champion have, here in Chicago. We haven't seen these guys for about 15 minutes. We saw a pack of them, and I think Romanchuk was in sort of third form yep, for that yep. time. He's now got a, over 400 meters lead. There's nobody else in sight. So he has blown them away over these last few miles. I mean, he's just exploded. And that power is all coming to the fore. You know, we said earlier on in our introduction to this marathon, this this kid could dominate for years to come. He's only 21, and he's proving that here. Oh, absolutely. He's got a two-minute lead right now. He is wow. just rolling like never before. And again, he won here last year. He's the new kid on the block. Since then, he won also at London and at Boston. Second at Tokyo. He also won at New York last year. So he had just been on a tear. And you can see the kid has such power, such strength such shoulders, this huge barrel chest also, great pulmonary capacity on him and the wingspan, we've talked about him before, 6'10 wingspan on this guy, he was made for this event. He really and was. He has the most calm demeanor, I mean, he's, he's so unassuming. He's a baby. And it seems as though he saves everything for the race course. He, he, he does. I love how some of his concerns lately have been, well, I have to pay a mortgage now, I have a house. Water bills. He's just a regular kid. You know, know? I really love the press conference when he picked up the microphone he said, I had to learn to hold one of these. How to use this, how I have to talk to people now. It's a completely different thing. He's fun to watch, too. You, when you get, you know, you learn more about him. He's just fun to watch because you know how unassuming he is. And But he's such a power. It's like these two personalities. He's like, he's Clark the beast. Clark he's the Clark Kent. That's a Very good way to Clark put it. With the glasses, he's bespeckled and everything. And, and he's amazing now. And, and I, I love the University of Illinois program. It's such a strong program and it builds such confidence in the lot. I mean, you can see. Harry Potter, was that name on the, <laughs> on the roster? It's, yeah, he's, he's, he's a rock star. He's great to see. And he's from Maryland, but I saw him at the press conference right before and I said, well, we're claiming you now. Anytime you, <laughs> you spend any time here in Illinois, you, you have been claimed. It's good to see him do well. And he should be crossing pretty soon. He should be getting close. I'm trying to get a sense of where exactly he might be. Well, the He's almost at the turn. He's almost at the turn at Roosevelt. Well, the record goes back to 2010. You know, they started really fast. Then there was that midsection where I think they were in the wind, maybe, and they were watching each other quite a bit. Need to, to, to check on the, the time that they're heading for in this wheelchair race. But, I mean, the speed, the power he's generating here, and I really like that flexibility in the shoulders. The rhythm he's developing is, is astonishing. Yes, and they built in a 40K uh, preem in here, kind of a sprint, to award them extra points for the World Marathon Majors. I think they got an extra eight points for whoever takes that. Uh, the thought being there'd be a group of guys and be able to sprint at that point and put some action in there. But he's all on his own, and he has certainly taken that preem at the 40K point. So he'll get some extra World Marathon major points for taking that. He probably won't need them. I mean, the rhythm, no, I don't. The he's going. No, it's, a, it's a little redundant at that point. Share those points. <laughs> just, just clear up that, uh, that time. Apparently, he's heading for something just outside 1.30. So because of those deliberations in the middle of the race, yeah. He's nowhere near record schedule, but do you think it's going to come? Of course it is. One of these Eventually, years. Eventually, yeah. yes. The record, what, 126.56, and that was set back in 2010. So it's a ways back by Heinz Fry, the gentleman that you mentioned. He Who's, who's now north of 60, but I mean, up so until very in, recent years, Heinz Fry has, been, his 50s, has been like the great mentor for this generation of wheelchair racers on the men's side. Yeah. Here he goes. This is the turn on to Roosevelt. Tim, you're going to call this as he makes his way back down Columbus Drive. This is always so exciting. This is the last little hill on the course, too. And so those, those chair pushers have to work a little bit harder going up this. God, I wonder and how then they'll make that turn right on. 
How are you feeling? How are you feeling? He's such a big guy. You know, you build that momentum, and of course, you generate that momentum and that acceleration. And it's kind of easier to keep it going. You know, it's like, like an oil tanker. It takes a long time to slow down and turn. And this guy is a tanker. I mean, this is, this is yes. a million barrel boy. This is just astonishing. He's over the, the peak of that hill now on the down slope. He'll probably accelerate. And they'll have trouble clearing the area behind the finish line, the speed he's moving oh, at. Oh, I bet. <laughs> Oh, he's Slight so downhill fun. finish as he makes his turn, and we will be able to see him just go right by All right, here our he studio. Comes. He's coming right now. Yep, we'll pass us in a second. Well, he celebrated his 21st birthday about a month ago. And Romanchuk here has picked up in Chicago where he left off last year. He's had a bunch of victories in between, a second place in Tokyo clears that bump safely and heads for the line to retain his title. It has been an astonishing performance from Manchuk. He has blown them away in the final quarter of this race and clear daylight behind him as he wins the 42nd Bank of America Chicago Marathon and kicks off Series 13 of the World Marathon Majors in spectacular style. Usually we, we see sprint finishes with three or four guys close together here in Chicago. That put him a class apart. He is so dominant now. It's so, and to see him so far ahead. Certainly a legend, back. a legend in the making oh, for, for sure. sure. We're gonna see him for years and years and years the beginning. To come. PR for him for this race by over a minute, I've been told. Uh, so uh, on a windy day, just absolutely phenomenal for him. I keep looking back to see when the next, the, the second place finisher, I don't see anybody. <laughs> He's, well, he's got to be getting used to this, at least, even if he's still learning to hold a microphone. <laughs> well, he had a, he had a two-minute lead, and he worked on most of that over the second half. Uh, so just a phenomenal, powerful athlete. Very happy for him. Okay, so we're not done yet. We have a long way to go. So much more excitement. We've got the women's wheelchair finish coming. We'll be back with more of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. Don't go anywhere. charity block party right about mile 15 at the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. There are more than 60 different charities that are out here that have runners running in the marathon. We're seeing some of the runners run by right now. And I went ahead and got me uh, a friend that was a little bit closer to my height. This is Elijah. Elijah, how old are you? Six and eight, I'm seven. You're seven? And you can see by looking at Elijah's hat that he's with Cal's Angels. It's one of the charities that are out here along this strip cheering on some of the runners. And it's a pretty big program. Can you tell me why you're here? Um, I sort of forgot though. You have a couple people that are running this race for you, correct? Yes. What's their names? Um, Austin, John, and Bridget. Austin, John, and Bridget are running on behalf of Elijah because you did what? Meet cancer. Wait, I need you to say it louder. I can't hear you. Meet cancer. Yes. Elijah beat cancer. You were diagnosed with leukemia at two and a half. And this past year, you beat it. And you are an inspiration for many runners out here, including the three running on your behalf. And that is what Cal's Angels does. And they have about 50 runners out here that are supporting several different children that have been fighting cancer. Thank you, Elijah. You did great. Give me a high five. And we have so much going on in here. You can feel the electricity of all the different people cheering on these runners as they pass through here. It's a really important mile marker because it's halfway. And in your mind, you're halfway there, but you just need that little extra push. And that is what's going on here at the Charity Block Party. We're going to have much more coming up throughout the show. Back to you. And welcome back to the 2019 Bank of America Chicago Marathon. We are looking at the one and only Bridget Koskai. She's been running by herself for most of the day. Mm -hmm. The concern 
here is whether or not she went out too fast. Well, last we were told she came through 25 kilometers at one hour, 19 minutes, 33 seconds. That's still two hours, 14 minutes, and 16 second pace. That's still ahead of world record pace. But remember, she was way ahead of world record pace earlier on. So the question is, how much has she slowed and can she continue her momentum going? Well, 2.14 tempo, what she has done is she's well past halfway. She's built up a big cushion behind her now. Now, I don't know, Carrie Tollefson, if you can hear us out there on the bike and if you can see the expression on the face of, of, uh, of Bridget Kozgai, has she shown any signs of strain yet? You know, she looks really good right now, Tim, but she did go through still a minute faster than what Paula Radcliffe went through 25K when she set her world record. So she's still doing really well. I don't think she's quite as comfortable as she was, you know, a few miles ago. But listen, she'll go through, she'll run 509, 509, then 512. And then she'll do 509, 509, 514. So I'm not quite sure if it's the Pacers or if it's her, but I do think that she's locked in right now. She's starting to show her teeth every now and then. Her eyes aren't always up. Sometimes they're kind of creeping down. And I find that when I see a runner at this vantage view, I see, I see their eyes drop and that kind of worries me. But right now she looks good. She's got a really good rhythm. Her arms are where they should be. Her legs, her knees are coming up. Her feet are coming off the pavement. She looks, she looks smooth. But there are those gl glimpses of, is she starting to falter when she has those slower miles? But then she pops right back on pace. Well, we'll see what happens. So, we know me, that she's she on Jackson great. right now. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you, Carrie. She's on her way on Jackson. She's in the West Loop. Manuela Shar is in the other box there. She has pulled away from the pack. And I can't tell exactly where she is, but she is quite a ways away from the, the rest of the pack that's right behind her. And she's been dominant lately. Now, we, we did wonder about Tatiana McFadden maybe making making a run this time around, maybe getting stronger because she has not been as strong the last few years after injury. But Manuela Shar has had a lot of wins under her belt now. She knows how she needs to win. She knows how she needs to race, presumably. Well, she's won every World Marathon major race. She's got seven in a row going, in fact. <laughs> uh, she's got a world record on an official course and the best time on an all-conditions course. So her confidence is sky high. I don't know that there's another wheelchair uh, in sight behind her currently. Um, again, just like Daniel Romanchek is kind of in a league of his own right now, uh, Manuela Schar has also found that same league, and it is major league. Yes, it is. She is on Michigan Avenue. Just taking to, our way to Roosevelt. Just to explain to people the World Marathon Majors, there are six venues, six races in the annual cycle, but actually there's seven races in the World Marathon Majors uh, uh, series because if Chicago starts this year's series, yep. Chicago next year will still end be in this series. series. It'll be the end of the right. series. So then you get six plus one, so seven to each series. And then, of course, next year, the, the following race after Chicago, which is New York, will be the beginning of Series 14. Right. And then you also add in, don't you, the World Championships and Olympics. the Olympics. Absolutely. Now, the conditions, you, you were talking about earlier that she has done well on hilly conditions. Well, she's done well on all conditions lately. You know, <laughs> right. There's not. But she's there, pretty much doing. You're right. She's there's not a condition win. that she doesn't do well in. And Heinz Fry is condition. the one who is her mentor, the one who she right. works with. And she's got a two-minute lead at this point. Two-minute lead. And I think Tatiana McFadden is in that pack a couple of minutes back. Uh, but a nice, comfortable two-minute lead. She's past the 40K mark at this point in time, so she's getting very close uh, to f finish it well. She would have also got that 40K pre that was there uh, for a sprint, but again, she's been doing her sprinting since the halfway mark. 